It's not always um, an easy venture um, being at the right in the middle of this um, milieu of, of science and politics and conservation, but it is a milieu. There is no um, separation. You cannot be involved in this business and think of yourself, oh, well, I just do the science or I just do uh, the conservation because it's all one thing. And it's important for us uh, to understand that. How many people in this room were um, eligible to vote in 1984? All right, most not. That's a good thing. All right, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, that's bad. Is there a way to get this to play? There's a, there's a video embedded, do you know? I can't find a cursor. There's a cursor. Down here? No. 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 Oh, uh, about there. Let's try that. It's not going to work. Okay, forget it. Um, so, if this video were working, <laughs> in 1984, Ronald Reagan was running for re-election. And um, he ran uh, two uh, commercials, which have gone into the annals of the history of politics. One was called Morning in America, a very... Uh, uplifting, um, uh, light uh, portrayal about how the, how the economy was coming back and it's morning in America again. The other was this one called The Bear in the Woods. So after this, go home, Google Bear in the Woods, watch the video. You'll see a very grainy video that shows a bear kind of in and out of this frame and the narrator is speaking in a very um, ominous tone about a bear. Some people say there's a bear in the woods. There might be a bear in the woods. Um, it takes you through this whole dialogue. It never really says anything, but it creates this ominous tone that there's a threat out there. Um, and clearly the bear was representing the Soviet Union at the time, but the general notion was there, it's a dangerous world, um, and you don't want to make a change in leadership at this, at this point. Um, Ronald Reagan won re-election in a landslide. Those two ads were uh, given great credit for creating the environment, the political environment, which supported Ronald Reagan's um, victory. And uh, for me, it has a lot to say about this notion of politics and conservation because we, um, if you are doing conservation, you are engaged in politics. Um, we are all, we are people. And, and here, you know, this uh, classic photo of Aldo Leopold and Olas Muri and, and this quote, there are two things that interest me, the relationship of people to each other and the relationship of people to the land, people. People are politics. And if we are involved in the conservation of wild life, we are involved in uh, people. We are in the business of managing people. Um, my wife always asks me, um, you know, we, uh, the, the wolf and, and issues around wolf management have been mentioned here several times. My wife always asks me oftentimes about wolf. She's a business person, and I say, well, the wolves actually will do fine on their own. It's the people um, that are the difficult part. And so when we are engaged in these propositions of conservation, we are engaged in politics. There is no uh, definition or a distinction between the two. Um, so uh, lesson one, I want you to um, as I transition to this next slide, I want you to think of the word civility. As we engage in this business 
Um, we, we have to be responsible for our actions and our words. And we need to create an environment of civility and respect. And so I would say, uh, as you engage in politics, remember that as that, that video that Ronald Reagan used as a platform for his re-election was about belief, because he knew he was, a, he was a, a penultimate politician. I did not vote for the man, I'll admit that right now, but he was a, a, an incredible politician and he realized that people make decisions based on belief. And we, as people that are trained as scientists, we like to think that we are better than that. We may be moderately better. But we make decisions based on belief and we stack facts to support our beliefs. And if we think the world is different, then we will not be effective as citizens and we will not be effective as conservationists. So we need to realize that people make decisions principally based on belief. Um, and if we are not cognizant and operative in that realm, then we'll be um, ineffective. And it's important for us to realize that it's not good or bad. Um, it's, it's the way human beings work. Um, and so as we, as we work in that environment, it's important for us to, re to remember that notion of civility. The second uh, lesson uh, is simplicity. Um, we are living in a world of seven billion people. By the middle of the century, we're on our way to nine billion people, if we're lucky. If we're not, it may be closer to 11 billion people. This quote here comes out of a book um, called um, Steal Like an Artist. Who my, my son, who's a senior at the University of Maryland, uh, gave to me. It's written by a, a man named Austin Kleon. You should get it. It's kind of the only kind of book I can read anymore. It's really like a picture book. Um, <laughs> um, and it's all about how, you know, the concept of an artist, that there is no or such thing as an original idea, that we are constantly in the process of adapting um, other people's ideas. Um, and, uh, but he has an important um, element in that book where he talks about um, the importance of simplicity um, and to, that if you are confronted with unlimited choices that it forms a kind of mental paralysis um, and that actually by limiting your choices you create the opportunity for creativity. And he uses the example of of Dr. Seuss, um, who, uh, who wrote uh, the book Cat in the Hat, one of the most uh, successful children's books of all time. He used 250 words when he wrote the book Cat in the Hat. Um, and his editor challenged him uh, that he couldn't write a book with 50 words, using only 50 words. He wrote the book Green Eggs and Ham. Uh, um, with uh, only 50 words. Um, so as we confront this uh, challenge of another 2 billion people in the planet and we will be consuming more of the ecological space on the planet, there's only one conclusion. There will be less uh, ecological space for everything else that we call biological diversity. Um, there is no other way to look at it. And so we have to make choices. You have to make choices about the world. And we have to make sure that we're telling the public that choices have to be made. Um, there will be less space in the world for wolves and grizzly bear and red cockaded woodpecker and manatee. Um, there, uh, that, there is no other way to see it. Um, so we have to make these choices. Um, and many of those choices will be based on belief and science can inform us in that exercise um, but unless we are aware of the fact that we are making choices and we are making choices that are built upon our belief then we will be um, uh, unsuccessful. 
Um, and in that quest for simplicity, the Fish and Wildlife Service is exploring the, uh, no, the notion of uh, species surrogacy. Can we look at the world and not endeavor to understand everything, 1,500 listed species, 850 species of migratory bird, dozens and dozens of anadromous fish uh, species, thousands of invertebrates. Um, but can we look at the world and make our job more simple by looking for things that we believe represent um, ecological sustainability at large scale? Uh, what we are doing today in the conservation of the sage grouse represents a great example of that, a species that ranges across 11 western states, um, 177 million acres um, of public estate, and, um, can, and if we can do well by the sage grouse, uh, then we will likely do well by the brewer sparrow, the sage thrasher, uh, the burrowing owl, mule deer, sharp-tailed grouse, uh, probably three to four hundred other species that occupy that same ecological niche. So, yes, politics and conservation. Um, think about civility, think about simplicity. Um, as you think about uh, these things, be engaged as many of the speakers here um, have, uh, have urged you to be, but be aware that if you are involved in this field of conservation, you are involved in politics. Thank you.